through Job chapter 1, the Bible says this. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright. One who feared God and one who turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house, each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered and told the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and turns away from evil. Has it ever dawned on you that maybe what you're going through in this life, God said, have you considered my servant and called your name? It's biblical. It's Bible. It's theology. It's what happened. And notice what the scripture says. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Here was the argument of Satan against Job. He only serves you because of what you've done for him. He only serves you because of what you have given him and for what you have done for him. Take it away and see what happens. Interesting. The Bible says in verse number 12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him, and do not. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven. And burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another. And said the Chaldeans formed three groups. And made a raid on the camels and took them and struck them down. With the servants and the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another. And said your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Everything Job had except for his wife and except for his relationship with God was gone. That fast. By the way, let me just say this. Everything that you have can be taken away just like that as well. And notice what Job did. Notice what Job did. Look what the Bible says. His response. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. What did Job do? He grieved. Job was suffering. Here's a man, think about this, here's a man in the eyes of the world that shouldn't be suffering. Why? Because the Bible says that he's an upright man. He's a just man. He's a man of integrity. He's a man that fears God and turns away from evil. But we find him suffering. See, sometimes the righteous do suffer. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. 
Here's Job grieving and suffering. Job arose and he tore his robe and he shaved his head and he fell on the ground in worship. And he said, naked came I from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. With God's help this morning, I'd like to preach on the subject, the suffering of Job with grief. You know, grief is a very difficult subject to talk about. We don't like to talk about death. We don't like to talk about the emptiness that death brings. And so quite frequently, what we do is we avoid the subject of grief altogether. But everybody look right up here. We're going to learn from the life of Job that grieving is normal. Grieving is absolutely normal. If you believe it, shout a big amen. amen. And suffering is the universal chord that strikes all mankind. And we all universally will grieve in this life because we're all affected by death. The Bible says it's appointed unto a man once to die, then after this comes the judgment. Every man is appointed to death. So therefore, we all grieve. And Job sets the precedence of how we suffer through grief. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's here this morning. Lord, we just ask you to do a work. Lord, I understand this morning that I can only reach the head, but you can reach the heart. Father, I pray that you'll tug on heartstrings, Holy Spirit. Lord, do the work that only you can. God, energize your servant for just a little while. We'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's done. In Jesus' name, everybody said, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Before they lost their husbands, Mildred and Helen lived in the same neighborhood. They attended the same church, and they had been friends for many years. The husbands, their husbands died about the same time, but the circumstances of their death were very different. Mildred's husband had cancer. The illness was discovered about a year before his death, but despite surgery and the best medical treatment available, his condition deteriorated as the months passed. Mildred devoted herself to the caring for the man whom she had been married to for more than 40 years. When he was hospitalized, she visited him every day. When he was at home, she cared for him tenderly, even when she was exhausted from taking care of his every need. With reluctance and only at the urging of her children and doctor, Mildred finally agreed to let her husband return to the hospital where he spent the final days of his life. During the year of this illness, the couple talked openly and often about death heaven and their life together. They had long discussions about the things they had regretted and the pleasant experiences they had shared. It was difficult, but they forced themselves to talk about the coming funeral and how Mildred would cope as a widow. Helen and her husband had no time for similar conversations. During a vacation trip, within weeks of his planned retirement, Helen's husband collapsed in a restaurant and was dead upon arrival at a local, rest uh, local hospital. A massive heart attack had taken his life and jolted Helen into an unexpected widowhood. From the beginning, it was clear to their friends that these two Christian women were handling their grief differently. Mildred talked freely about her husband and admitted her loneliness and her empty heart. Slowly, she resumed her activities at church, even though she didn't feel like participating at first. She determined to keep involved in the lives and activities of her grandchildren and eventually moved into a facility for senior citizens where she could be independent but surrounded by friends and opportunities for activity. It took time, but as the months passed, Mildred began to pick up the activities of her life again. Today, she spends much of her time helping the old people, even though she herself is well into her 80s. Helen withdrew from people after her husband died. She stopped seeing her friends, appeared to lose interest in, her, in the grandchildren that previously had been important in her life, and spent days sitting in front of a television set, feeling depressed and engulfed in self-pity. After years of closeness with her husband, Helen concluded that life was no longer worth living and that she would never be happy again. Despite the urgings of her children and her doctor, Helen rarely ate healthy or regular meals. Soon her health began to deteriorate, and after two years, her widowhood began 
Helen's heart stopped beating one night while she slept. Her friends and family agreed she died of a broken heart. She also died without any joy, without saying goodbye, and without seeing her grandchildren who grew up. Mildred and Helen were two good friends who mourned in different ways and whose lives went two very different directions in the later years. Grief, it's difficult. Job, what we find out about Job in Scripture is that Job suffered deeply and greatly from his loss. Can you imagine ten children in the same day? Ten children, ten caskets, and ten funerals. It's beyond human uh, comprehension. And we learn from Job's life that grieving is normal and it's not a sign of weakness. See, some, sometimes what, what we find is that the enemy begins to get busy when we start grieving. And the enemy begins to make us feel uh, like that we're weak because we're grieving. The enemy makes us feel like that we should just get over what we're feeling and, and we shouldn't be grieving in the way that we are. And, and that's not what the scripture teaches The scripture teaches that grieving is normal, and Job grieved when he heard of the loss of his children. See, I heard a quote, someone said, when someone loses a loved one, it's like an amputation. An amputation hurts and takes time to heal, but the part that's removed can never, never be replaced. Boy, isn't that true? And and, and one of the things that we understand about grieving is it is difficult to talk about. It is difficult to be open and honest with others about it. And so often what we do is there's a level of guilt and shame that comes sometimes with our grieving. If we feel like that we haven't uh, surpassed expectations of people, sometimes we feel guilty for grieving. The enemy makes you feel guilty for grieving, and so therefore you grieve alone. That's a lie from the enemy is that you have to grieve alone. You absolutely do not have to grieve all by yourself. And you do not have to feel guilty. It doesn't matter how long the loss has been. It doesn't matter uh, what the circumstances regarding the loss were. You never have to feel guilty in this life for grieving. Why? Because grieving is normal. And we learn that from the life of Job. We learn that from a a man of God. And so as we are broaching this subject, as we are uh, entering into the scripture, and we're going to look at Job's life, I I think that it's important to understand what is the definition of grief. And so look right up here. Grief is a normal. Somebody say normal. Grief is a normal response to the loss of any significant person, object, or opportunity. Grief is a normal response. See, what is not normal is when you do not grieve. Amen? Job was a man of God. Job was a spiritual man, and yet he still grieved. The Bible says that he tore his robe. The Bible says that he shaved his head. These are the classic signs of traditional grief in the Old Testament times. And Job took time to grieve in his heart. And so it's absolutely critical for you to understand this morning that grief is a normal response to the loss of any significant person, object, or opportunity. And, and, and it's, uh, it's an often an experience of deprivation and anxiety that can show itself in your behavior, in your emotions, thinking, physiology, relationships, and spirituality. And oftentimes we think, well, the only time that we really grieve is if we lose, lose a person. Well, that's not really true. Sometimes we grieve over a divorce. Sometimes we grieve because of retirement. We grieve because of a loss of a home, the loss of a pet, health failures. Some people grieve because the loss of their youthful appearance. Boy, I should have got about half of you saying amen right there. Some people grieve over children leaving the home, empty nest syndrome. And and, and it can go on, and it can go on, and it can go on. But but what I want you to see from the scripture this morning, the first thing I want you to notice is, number one, Job's grief. I want you to notice Job's grief, that that, that through his life, there are many insights to the nature of grief. And and I want to look at four different areas where this grief affected Job straight from the scriptures. Number one, the first thing is that, that grief affected Job physically. It affected him physically, his physical person. The Bible says that when Job's came, in, in verse uh, Job 2 and 12, that when Job's friends came uh, to, to see him, the Bible says they didn't recognize him. Physically, he looked, uh, he looked differently. 
And what grief will do is it will take a toll on you physically. It absolutely will. It will show up on the outside. See, grief affects you on the inside, but it also shows up on the outside. And it did in Job's life. And guess what? Sometimes grief will show up on the outside, and that's okay. You don't have to feel guilty about that because it's the normal response. This is God's normal response in your life to the res- responding from the loss that you are dealing with. And so Job's grief, number one, it affected him uh, physically. But not only did it affect him physically, it also affected him emotionally. Look what Job 3 and 1 says. After this, Job opened up his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. Job was an emotional wreck. He's a man of God. He's a man who loved God. He's a man who feared God. He's a man who turned away from evil. He's a man who always did right what was in the sight of God. But yet here he is cursing the day of his birth. You ever been there? Have you ever been to the place in life where you wish you weren't born? Job was there. It affected him. Grief shows up sometimes not only physically but it shows up emotionally and this idea that that Job was just this picture perfect Christian man who never had any doubts who never had any questions that is not true even though the Bible says that in all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly listen Job had trouble dealing with his loss and he cursed think about that he x the day that he was born he wishes that he could have blotted it out It affected him emotionally. Not only did it affect him physically and emotionally, but it also affected him spiritually. How many know when something affects us physically and emotionally, it also affects us spiritually? How did did his grief affect him spiritually? It clouded his vision of God. Notice what Job 3 and 4 says. It says this. It says, let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. His view of God was clouded because of the grief. That he was going through. By the way, there is always an adversary who will show up when you grieve in this life. There is always an enemy that will come against you and battle you spiritually. The enemy will say things like this. Well, if you were really a man of God, if you were really a woman of God, you wouldn't be so weak in a time like this. How many know every time the devil opens up his mouth, he's a liar? The devil is a liar and the father of all lies. Amen? Amen? And it will affect you. And so Job's grief, it affected him physically. It affected him emotionally. It affected him spiritually where he clouded uh, clouded his vision of God. We begin to wonder. We begin to question. We begin to doubt. God, how could you have allowed my loved one to die? God, how could the circumstances have turned this? God, if you were really a God of love, if you were really a God of power, you could have healed my loved one. You could have prevented it. You could have stopped it from happening, God. Our view sometimes of God gets clouded. When we're dealing with grief, Job's view of God was clouded through his grief. It affected him physically. It affected him emotionally. It affected him spiritually. Not only that, but it also affected him relationally. It it, it was difficult with his relationship with his spouse. Remember, the devil said you can take everything you can that you want to away from Job, but you can't take his own life. Isn't it interesting that his wife was still left? You know what this speaks to? That the two shall be one flesh. This speaks to the value of the of the union before God. That that when when two uh, in holy matrimony, when two are joined together, they are no longer two but one flesh. But in in Job chapter two, we find this conversation between Job and his wife. And sometimes I think we don't understand Job's wife enough. Everybody look right up here. She lost ten children as well. And now not only has Job, uh, have they lost their ten children and lost their livestock and they lost everything that they had, but now Job has been afflicted physically with boils on his body and, and I believe that she was tired of seeing her husband suffer. And this is what she said. She says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? You know what Job said? He turned to his wife and he says, why do you talk like a foolish woman? It affected him relationally. See, sometimes grief throws the the universe out of whack. Everybody look right up here. It's okay. 
What we have to learn is that it's okay. And we cannot allow the enemy to make us feel guilty. We cannot allow the enemy to condemn us because we are uh, allowing normal responses in our life. Job lost his children. Think about that for a minute. He lost his offspring. Grief is a normal response to the loss of any significant person. If you believe it, shout a big amen. amen. And Job's grief, it affected him physically, it affected him emotionally, it affected him spiritually, it affected him relationally. It caused problems in his relationships. And, and, and listen, what we learn is there are different types of grief based on the different type of loss. There is normal grief. See, what we find is that an aging parent, it's easier to lose an aging parent to disease that we've had time to uh, come to cope. We've had, we've had time to learn to accept that they're going to die in their 80s and their 90s than it is. It's, that's normal grief. Complicated grief is when you lose a parent at five years old. That's complicated. That's, that's not the same as losing an aging parent in their 80s. Losing a parent when they're 30 is a lot different than losing a parent when they're 80. And so what we find is that there are different types and natures of loss. There are different types and natures of grief. And so based on the severity, you either have a normal grief or you have a complicated grief. And people grieve differently. Job, he grieved immediately. And I've witnessed this as a police chaplain. Over the last, I've been serving as a police chaplain over the last eight years. I have done hundreds of death notifications to complete strangers, people that I've never known a day in my life. And I have seen every type of response imaginable when you knock on somebody's door and let them know that their loved one died. Sometimes it's a husband who committed suicide up on 77th Street up in North Sedgwick County. Wife broke down in tears, said I shouldn't filed for divorce last week. Now I'm going to deal with this for the rest of my life. She was going to blame herself for her husband's choice that he made. But she was grieving. I've had to tell parents that their child was killed in a car accident at 16 years of age. Knock on the door. I've seen every, res listen, I've seen people grieve immediately. I've seen some people not grieve at all by th for the time that I'm there. Some people, here, here's what you need to understand is that it's no one's job to tell you how you grieve. Because some people grieve openly, some people grieve privately. Some people grieve immediately, some people have delayed, what's called delayed onset grief. Amen? And, and, and what we find is that this is all normal. And, and it's not my job to tell you how you grieve or how you're not to grieve. Job didn't care who was around. The Bible says that, that he, he ripped his robe and he, he shaved his head. And, and he displayed the classic symptoms of grief openly. But that's not how everybody grieves. And that's okay. But for Job, one of the things that we see affected him physically, emotionally, spiritually, and relationally. Job's grief. The second thing I want you to see as we deal with this idea of suffering and grief is number two, Job's friends. Job's friends. Look at verse, turn in your Bibles to, to Job chapter 2, beginning in verse number 11. The Bible says this, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shunite, and Zophar the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come show him sympathy and to comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Here we find one of the most moving scenes in all of the account of Job in his suffering. This is where Job's three friends, they each leave their homes, their respectable homes, and they come together, they have a meeting, and they decide they want to show up, and they want to show sympathy and comfort Job. Man, this is incredible. They showed up, and they displayed the same classic uh, 
uh, gestures of grief that Job did. They tore the robe. They put ashes on their head. And here they are really sympathizing. And, and, and their heart is really going out to their friend. They sat with him for seven days and seven nights. Think about that. The Bible says that no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his suffering was very great. Man, I don't, I don't think that we can properly identify with the suffering of Job. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit says that his suffering was very great. How do we say it? How do you really describe suffering when you lose children like that? I don't think that there is words that can adequately describe the suffering that Job was going through. And his three friends decide they want to show up and they just want to be there for him. They just want to show up and, and, and they want to be there. And the Bible says that, that they did not say a word. I believe that they were the fulfillment of Paul's words in Romans 12, 15, where it says to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Man, what love, what compassion that these friends showed Job. They left their jobs they left their families, they left the comfort of their own home, and they traveled a distance. They, they didn't just walk across the street. They traveled each different distances to come and to be with their suffering friend because they wanted to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. Boy, aren't you thankful for good godly friends that love you and genuinely care for you in your time of need? And what we find is in Job chapter 4, Job's friends finally speak after seven days. And here's what we learn. All the wisdom of their silence quickly departed. All the wisdom of their silence quickly departed. Notice things went downhill fast when they opened up their mouths. Can I remind you that sometimes it's just best to say nothing? Here's, everybody look right up here. You don't have to figure out the theological reason for somebody's suffering. Just weep with them. You don't have to answer all their questions. Just weep with them. And sometimes, as Christians, we're as guilty as anybody on the planet for thinking we have to figure out why everyone's suffering. We have to figure out why God did what God did. Listen, there are, the Bible just says that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. There are some things about God you're just never going to figure out. Amen. And Job's friends, hear me out. Don't lose me now. Job's friends tried to find a theological explanation for Job's suffering. Everybody look right up here. God doesn't need you to take his place. God doesn't need us. To take his place and to explain somebody's suffering. And, and, and what they did is they tried to make Job feel like that what he was, the result of his suffering was because of personal sin in his life. Job's friends didn't understand what you and I just read out of Job chapter 1. That God and Satan had a discussion in heaven. They didn't know that. They didn't get that. They didn't understand that. So what they did is that they tried to step into the shoes of God and explain the suffering of their friend. And the only thing that they could think of is that their suffering, or that his suffering was a direct result of sin in his life. Because the only time that a person suffers is because of personal sin. Everybody look right up here, it just wasn't the case. It just wasn't accurate. And you have uh, 15 to 20 chapters through the book of Job that deal with the conversations between Job's three friends and Job and their accusations and their false theological argument when they shouldn't have never opened up their mouths. See, there are some times that people say things when a person is grieving that will just make you cringe. There are some things that you just shouldn't say to somebody that's grieving. Shout a big amen. amen. Things like this, well, I know how you feel. No, you don't. No, you don't. There are some people in here, man, that, that have suffered, and, and God, God's grace 
has just held them up in a special way. I, I think about Bobby, Bobby and her suffering. I think about Steve. Steve's not here. He's sick this morning. Their loss of children, their loss of their adult children. You know what? I don't know how they feel. And for me to say, well, I, I know how you, you're probably going through this and and, and you're probably having doubts. and I, the, the reality is, is I've never told them I know how you feel because I just don't. And even if you've lost a child, sometimes the circumstances are different. So you still don't even know how they feel. We got to be careful on the things that we say. The things that we, well, I, yeah. And, and, and it's not only, well, I, I know how you feel. But, but things, listen, we, we try to get spiritual. And we try to get theological. Things like this. Well, God just wanted another angel. No, he didn't. That's not even biblical. We don't turn into angels. Trying to make somebody feel, feel better. Well, God, God must have needed another angel. Stop. Stop. Stop saying stuff like that to somebody that's grieving. Don't give somebody false hope. That their loved one is going to be an angel following them around. That's not what the Bible teaches. And if God wanted another angel, he'd create him another angel. Amen. A person that's hurting doesn't need comments like that. Well, God never gives us more than we can handle. Really? Find me a chapter and a verse for that one. The Bible doesn't teach that. Some people say, well, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, chapter, uh, chapter number 10, verse number 13, there is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful and make a way up to escape that you may be able to bear it. That doesn't teach that God will give you more than you can handle. It just doesn't. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite is true. Sometimes God gives us more than we can handle so we can turn it to him. So we can cast all of our cares upon him. Saying things like this, you have to be strong for your other kids. Come on, get over it. You got to be stronger than that. Because those people need you in their life. Or saying things like this, well, there's a reason for everything. Yeah, I know there's a reason for everything, but you can say that at a diff different time. Amen? And there are things that, listen, if we're not careful that we become Job's friends, is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to, to, to give you some practical application when, when people are grieving. There are just some things that you don't say. Sometimes it's better just to do this. Because pride makes us think we've got it all figured out. Pride makes us think that we have an answer for every question that there is in life. Saying things like this, quote, cheer up, your loved one wouldn't want you sad. Can't you find something else better to say or not say? Because it's not easy to cheer up when you're grieving. You tell somebody that just buried 10 of their children to cheer up, see how that works for you. Amen. Amen. We don't need to be like Job's friends. We need to be the fulfillment of Job's friends before they open their mouth. That's the picture that God wants us to see here. And what we need to do is that we need to be there for someone. And, and by all means, if somebody asks you a question, feel free to try to answer their question. But don't voluntarily try to answer somebody's questions that you think they're having in their mind. You with me? If somebody calls you on the phone and says, why did this happen? Or listen, pray about it. And sometimes you just say, I don't know. But all I know is that God is in control. Saying things like, it's been a while. It's time to pull yourself together. Everybody, how many know Job's friends? They lost all of their wisdom when their silence departed. Amen? And we learn from Job's friends, in the end, that it's better not to have a friend than it is to have a bad one. It's a whole lot easier to suffer alone than to have somebody standing next to you that's pointing fingers and, and bringing accusations that's adding to the suffering that you're already enduring. See, what we find is that Job was now not only suffering with grief, now he's suffering from false accusations. Amen? Things, we say things to people. Things like this at funerals. If you ever need something, call me. How about this? You call them because they're going to need something. 
Amen? How about don't say call me if you ever need, if you need something. How about you go ahead and call them because they're going to need something. They're going to need someone to talk to. They're, gonna, they're, they're going through something, and they need somebody to, to vent to. They need somebody that they can share with. You with me? Say a lot of different things. We've got to be careful. We have to guard ourselves of becoming Job's friends. So we see Job's grief. We see Job's friends. Last but not least, and I'm done, we see Job's God. In spite of all the suffering from grieving and, uh, and Job's friends and family, here's what we find. Job's God was right there with him all along. God was with Job all along. Job doubted. I've heard people say, man, Job is just this amazing guy. He never had any questions. He never had any doubts. You haven't read Job then. Because he had a lot of questions and he had a lot of doubts. And guess what? It's okay to question, and it's okay to doubt. What it's not okay to do is slip into unbelief. See, the difference between doubt and uncertainty is this. Doubt is inner uncertainty, and unbelief is the refusal to believe. Big difference between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief is a sin. Unbelief is the refusal to believe. God, I refuse to believe in you. That's unbelief. Doubt is just the inner uncertainty. I don't understand why. How could this be? That's doubt. And you know what? God was patient with Job through his doubts. You don't have to feel guilty through your doubts. By the way, did you know that John the Baptist, who Jesus said there's none greater in, in, in the New Testament, John the Baptist doubted? If John the Baptist, who Jesus said there's never been a man greater, doubted, guess what? You and I are going to doubt from time to time. But here's what we see, and this is, this, this is the picture of the Father I want to get you this morning. We see God is patient with doubt, with, with, with Job and his doubts and his questions. We don't, we don't have a God in heaven who is mad and angry and, and ready to, 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 to judge us for our doubts. We serve a God who is long-suffering. We serve a God who is patient. We serve a God who understands us when no one else does. We serve a God who has all the answers when Job's friends don't have all the answers. And even though we have doubts and even though we have questions, we have a God who is patient with us through that. What we find in the book of Job is there's a process that starts taking place in Job's life. Grieving is a process, folks. Grieving is a process. There is no set amount of time. You don't Start grieving on this day and stop grieving on this day. You with me? It's a process. And that's what we see in Job's life. But we see the one thing that's constant and the one thing that remains the same is God was always with Job. God never left his side. And here's, here's what I would want to encourage you with this morning is that we have the promises and the hope of Scripture that one day we're going to a place where there'll be no more suffering from grief. We are going to a place, God is taking, God is preparing us a place today for a place where there will be no more grief and no more suffering from the heartache. The Bible says that God will wipe away every tear from our eye, every pain will be taken, there will be no more pain, there will be no more heartache in that city, and there will be no more death. If you're thankful, shout a big amen this morning. God is in the business of providing us a place where there will be no more grieving and no more suffering. Until then, until then, somebody say until then, we have the promise of the abiding presence of God to comfort us in our grieving and in our suffering. We're all going to grieve. We're going to grieve differently. Every person under the sound of my voice has dealt with grief. Isn't it amazing we don't like to talk about it? Isn't it amazing we don't like to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, Man, I'm really grieving loss this morning. Too often we feel guilty because of our grieving. But we have to understand that it's normal. It's an absolutely normal response to the loss of any significant person. And this is what I really want to leave you with. That, that, that God has given us the promise of his abiding presence. But he's also blessed us with the gift of community within the body of Christ for reasons like this. We don't have to suffer alone. God has blessed us 
with the gift of community. Think about what God did when he ordained the church to come together. The church is a community. It's more than a building. A church is a community of believers. And think about how, how, how many times that, that maybe Bobby and Steve have been encouraged in their suffering because they understand that at least someone somewhat understands them. Not all the way, but at least someone. And so what they have done is they have chosen to work through their suffering. They've chosen to work through their grief. And they've not isolated themselves, but they've drawn closer into the community. But the devil wants to isolate you in your grief. He wants to push you off in a corner. And he wants to load you down with guilt. He wants to load you down with shame. He wants to load you down with condemnation. And he wants to make you think if you're really a good Christian... You'd be over this by now. If you really had strong faith in God, you wouldn't be grieving the way that you're grieving right now. And the reality is the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. This is why I'm a big, big fan of support groups like grief. Grief supports. Getting together with other people that are going through similar emotional responses that you are so that you don't have to suffer alone amen we're all grieving in some form or fashion you say man it's been a long time since i've lost somebody that's really close to me i hate to burst your bubble but tomorrow could be your bad day tomorrow you could lose the closest person to you and you're going to need exactly what i preached to you this morning that Job suffered greatly and deeply with grief. And that it's absolutely normal. Absolutely 100% normal. It was complicated. Job just didn't have what we consider normal grief. His was complicated grief. There are a lot of different factors. When you never get the chance to say goodbye, there's a, there's a difficult difficulty with that. I didn't get the chance to say goodbye to my loved one. If, if you weren't on speaking terms when they died, there's difficulty to that. So grief can become, it, not only does it have the ability to be normal grief, but there's also the complicated grief. The loss of a child is always complicated grief because it's not in the natural order of things. Parents, spouses, hopefully you outlive your children. When a child dies, the whole universe seems out of whack. Nothing makes sense. Absolutely nothing in the universe makes sense. But God's still on his throne. But God is still on his throne. If you're suffering this morning with grief, you don't have to suffer alone. You don't have to allow the enemy to load you down with guilt and shame. You can find help in the name of the Lord this morning. Let's bow for prayer.